to start this conference, I think we have to start uh, with the award of New European with all those women who are fighting in Belarus for freedom. Then I, I will give the floor to Roger Casal and to Maria Laura uh, and uh, to do a nice declaration about this award of New Europe and for all those women who are fighting in Belarus. Thank you very much indeed, um, Olivier. And I'm going to ask my colleague, Maria Laura Franciosi, to introduce the New European of the Year Award and explain why we are giving the New European of the Year Award to uh, the women of the opposition of Belarus. Maria Laura. Okay. Um, do you hear me? Can you no. hear me? Yes. yes. Well, I mean, this was uh, uh, a great opportunity to recognize the, um, the work, the effort of uh, so many, uh, so many people, and particularly so many uh, women, girls, old and, uh, and uh, young uh, women uh, who fought, uh, who have been fighting since uh, August for the um, right of the people to express themselves in, uh, in uh, free elections. This is what did not happen in uh, Belarusia, and, uh, um, and, and this is what, uh, why they are protesting for all, uh, for, have been protesting for all these months. Um, we want to uh, acknowledge, I mean, I, I came across this big problem when I got a message from the, um, a person from a uh, Belarusian uh, lady who lives in uh, Italy, and uh, she, was, she wanted to inform the press that what was happening. And uh, so uh, with, also with the new Europeans, we decided to support this big effort. Uh, the, this person was Caterina, uh, who is listening to us. And, uh, um, and so uh, the, the new Europeans, uh, the, the Secretary General of New Europeans, Roger Casale, decided to uh, create this new European of the Year Award. And the new European of the Year Award was um, given, assigned to uh, the women of Belarus. And uh, so I think this is uh, uh, the best that at the moment we could do apart from supporting uh, all the efforts with writing, with informing the Europeans of what's happening in uh, uh, Belarus. Um, I also have this sort of official recognition of uh, the sacrifice of all these women, young women also, including the, also the men, because the women support all the people, they have children to look after, and still they go in the streets and protest. And this is something that should really awake the um, interest of the whole of Europe for this big effort in a country which is uh, demanding uh, freedom of expression. So uh, I think uh, as a journalist, I could, um, I really wanted to underline the importance of this, uh, of, of this uh, acknowledgement. Um, so I passed the, uh, I think I, uh, now Roger Casale could, uh, um, do you read the citation yourself or do you want me to read it or what? I think it's Thank you very much, Maria Laura. Yes, you. Um, I'll come back to you to to read the uh, okay. the citation, uh, if I may. Um, but uh, yes, indeed. Just allow me, if I may, to uh, say a few words uh, to you. Yes. Thank you very much, indeed, uh, Maria Laura, for what you have uh, what you have just said. So. Um, 
it, we we um, we discuss this as a board. So um, that's uh, Maria Laura and myself and Olivier, uh, and also my colleague Paul Hellingson and our colleague Alan Hick. And um, this was a completely unanimous decision to award the New European of the Year Award to the women, opposition women of Belarus. Uh, and we are really humbled and uh, honoured to be able to do so and to have uh, Olga and Ekaterina with us tonight to, to accept this award on behalf of the of the women of, of Belarus. And of course, it's, um, it, it's not the... Um, only award that is going to the, uh, um, the women of, of Belarus, the, also receiving the Sakharov Award from the European Parliament, Human Rights Award, and I'm sure many other awards will follow. I know that awards um, don't make up for the lack of democracy in Belarus, but I think they are a sign that we appreciate you uh, so much as we do and we learn from you. And of course, this is not the first time that we've seen Olga and Ekaterina, because on International Democracy Day, we had the first in our series of Quo Vadis, Belarus, Ukraine, and uh, Russia. And I think it's the first time that I've been in one of these events, and I have seen five of the 15 uh, participants, uh, including myself, uh, in tears on screen at what was being said. And I don't think uh, uh, any of us have seen quite a few things. Uh, some of us have seen quite a few things, events in our life. I was, I was there when the Berlin Wall came down. Um, but I mean, this was, this was uh, a very, very powerful at an emotional level. And you've touched, uh, you've touched our, our hearts uh, uh, and in, in, in a very profound, in a profound way. And we are, we're concerned for you, concerned also for your, for your safety. But I think that the, the three things that I, I would like to say in terms of this award is just to explain. I mean, we, we don't just give the new European of the Year award to sort of, you know, the next best thing that comes along, and you are you are the, in a way that, you know, very much a centre of international attention. Still, I, I well, we got the American elections, but you, for me, you're very much at the centre. We need to keep you at the centre of international attention. But I would say there are three reasons uh, that we're giving the award tonight. I mean, we, we give the award because it has something to do with our mission, which is to do with what it means to be European, a citizen of Europe. What democracy means and we know that belarus is a it's a special case we don't want to get it mixed up in things to do with europe and putin russia and everything but you're an inspiration to us in our work i'd like to say that uh, for three reasons I, the first one is because democracy matters you know and uh, that's what you're fighting for pure and simple we can't be free without democracy and that's a that's a universal aspiration and you personify it today I think the second reason is if you want to have talk about democracy, you've got to talk about inclusion. And you've got to have uh, the, not just the voice of women, but you've got to empower women if you want to build democracy. And I think that is why your movement is so inspirational to so, uh, to so many of us uh, in the world today. And the third reason I think is that what we understand everywhere is that it's time for citizens to take their own future in their hands. And so it's um, really with a great, great, um, great humility uh, that we uh, offer this small gesture really to you to say, thank you, um, be careful, stay safe, and, but please do ca carry on and, and, and win and you, you will win. Uh, and uh, we are with you, and we are very proud to be able to say that we stand with the women of Belarus. And now I hand back to Maria Laura to, to hand over, to, to read out the, the citation. Maria Laura. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I was just checking and uh, saw that there are seven, seven women and seven men <laughs> listening to the, quite interesting. Now, uh, the new Europeans uh, is delighted to announce that we are awarding the new European of the Year Award to the women of Belarus opposition. Now, this is the citation. The struggle for democracy is a universal aspiration of all freedom loving people. In Belarus, women have put themselves on the front line of the fight 
for free, fair, and open elections. By standing up in the face of the tyranny, they are putting their own safety at risk. They do so because they know that they are the right, that they have the right to demand that their voices be heard. The physical presence of so many women um, protesters has also helped protect male protesters from an unending frenzy of police brutality. But there are many cases of violence against women too. As the world looks on, we are witnessing extraordinary acts of courage, compassion, and solidarity. We are humbled to stand with the women of Belarus. In making this award, we, we salute their bravery, their determination, and the example that they are giving in a dangerous and unstable world that cries out for hope and for liberty. Thank you. Bravo. Bravo. Very nice declaration. Now uh, I must give the floor to to Katerina, to Olga. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, Olga, Olga, uh, Olga, Olga from Belarus. <laughs> Olga from Belarus. Oh, Olga, yes, yes. <coughs> uh, <coughs> I uh, am flattered, and I want to thank you for the opportunity to present uh, the Russian woman as, as uh, taking this award. <coughs> it, it's rather unexpected for me. <clears throat> but I understand that this is uh, uh, only something that uh, really women of Belarus uh, deserve. Uh, we are now indeed uh, fighting in an equal battle, unequal battle with the regime. And our only weapon is uh, our peaceful protest and strike, probably. Uh, so our peaceful strike uh, is not bringing very much results in the respect of violence because uh, uh, we witness escalation of this violence again and again. Today, one more person died. Uh, <laughs> a young guy, he was beaten up by, by the police severely yesterday. <laughs> and he was 31 and he was, you know, very nice guy. Uh, they just beaten him till he died, and he died today in coma, in hospital. Uh, mm -hmm. Still a lot of stories of violence. And uh, yeah, I was fined, as you know, I was in court. Uh, and thousands, uh, thousands of people are still persecuted. Even Miss Belarus 2008, it has got 27 days of arrest for her peaceful protest. Today was, uh, she was in court and she, was, um, uh, she has now to be there for 27 days. You say that uh, um, you want to keep uh, the world um, aware of the situation, but what I want to say is that, uh, first of all, um, most of the people in Belarus have to be aware of the situation. People have to wake up because still, um, of course, we're feeling a lot of anxiety, but uh, people have to wake up. Factories should start full-scale strike uh, because without that, we will not uh, uh, move forward in our protest. Um, and just to sum up, um, uh, what we are fighting for, these are the three or uh, four, four main uh, demands. We want uh, Lukashenko's resignation. We want uh, uh, all the political prisoners to be released. And we want, of course, an investigation of all crimes against uh, uh, civilians, peaceful people. And we want new, fair and open elections. Mm -hmm. If we will not... Uh, uh, keep fighting. If we will not wake up as a nation, finally, we will 
one day wake up in a concentration camp because this is what it's, it is leading to these days. Uh, <coughs> and yes, and um, I thank you all for the support. I always tell, after our, our first meeting, I uh, was discussing it with all my friends, saying that so many people with experience, with knowledge, they support us and we have to continue our struggle. So I thank you for this support and for the attention you are giving to us. Well, Gia, thank you very much for this emotional speech. Um, and now may maybe uh, Ekaterina from Italy, you, uh, you must say something. Yes, I will do it with very much pleasure. Thank you so much for your support and for your solidarity and for the beautiful words that Maria Laura and Roger said. The Belarusians who live abroad are watching carefully what's going on in Belarus and we live in a continuous anxiety. Also, we, we feel helpless because we are so far and we cannot do uh, anything concrete to help our uh, fellow citizens who are fighting in Belarus. We can only donate money and we can speak up for those who cannot do it. So um, thank you so much for your um, will to go on speaking about what's going on in Belarus and especially of the crimes of the regime. As Olga said, today um, one more person died because, of, because he was uh, beaten to death by the police yesterday night. Um, it's only one of the cases. All the people who get arrested during peaceful protests, and last Sunday we had over 1,000 cases, all these people are tortured and beaten up severely by the police. Um, we, I mean, the Belarusian diaspora uh, do what we can from afar, and we really hope that this situation is going to end up as soon as possible, because uh, on, on the one hand, it is clear that the regime cannot exist for a long time anymore. It's only a matter of time. But on the other hand, all that time that will pass mm, between today and the day that the regime um, ends its existence, during all this time, people will continue suffering. Um, that is why we do what we can in order to draw attention of the world to the, mm, to the situation in Belarus and uh, Thank you so much for your help and for your support and for your solidarity. Bravo. Thank you for your examples. Uh, thank you for fighting. And uh, in, in Ukraine, we had our Titushki and in Belarus, you have also your Titushki. Um, for me also it's very sensitive because what's happened in Ukraine some years before was the same emotional things. Now uh, we have to give the floor to Alexandra. Alexandra who will present Ukraine, what's going on in Ukraine with the last elections. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh... Yeah, it's difficult to continue after this emotional speech. So we are actually together with Belarus trying to, to help here and uh, also following the situation. It's really very similar with Maidan it was. So uh, I, I actually did a small presentation. Uh, I will try to uh, switch on a demonstration of the screen. So hopefully it will be successful. Uh, just a moment. Uh, yeah, but I think this function is not uh, actually working, unfortunately. Uh, so I will I will do without uh, PowerPoint. 
Uh, so in Ukraine, uh, after revolution in 2014, uh, now we have a real risk uh, of uh, revenge uh, of pro-Russian forces again. And uh, the local elections that been, uh, happened, to, uh, uh, happened 25th of October, uh, actually uh, showing um, straightening the pro-Russian parties in Ukraine. And um, also we see that um, uh, party of the President Zelensky, the servant of the people, is getting less and less support from Ukrainian people. Uh, and uh, I think during one year they lost uh, quite a huge uh, part of their ratings in Ukraine, uh, mostly uh, due to uh, not much progress with anti-corruption reforms and judicial reform. Uh, so uh, we have uh, straightening, uh, especially in the east, uh, uh, in the eastern part of Ukraine, uh, the uh, pro-Russian party is called Platform for Peace, actually winning uh, the first places and mayors um, in the most uh, regions in Ukraine and uh, also in each region this party is represented. Uh, the pro-Russian oligarchs are getting more and more power again and um, uh, actually even over the president and over the uh, constitutional court. As you know, in Ukraine, uh, there is a uh, constitutional court crisis. Uh, so the court took crazy decision just to cancel uh, declarations for uh, state servants uh, in Ukraine. And now it's um, actually um, more than 100 criminal, criminal cases uh, against corrup corruptioners. Uh, corrupted people and corrupted uh, politics in Ukraine must be closed. Uh, so this is quite controversial decision and um, uh, I think it's a risk of political crisis and economical crisis in Ukraine and uh, this local uh, elections showing um, uh, the growth uh, of uh, pro-Russian forces, the growth of oligarchs projects and um, uh, also the weakness of central government because with decentralization reform uh, the local elections are getting more and more important. Uh, there are a lot of local projects, political pro projects in Ukraine that getting more important uh, and funding by the local businessmen. Uh, so uh, I think uh, it's really, according to my analysis, uh, now it's uh, really risk uh, to have a flashback to Yanukovych time actually. Uh, and um, a lot of uh, corrupted people are uh, in government again. And actually, this is the reason why uh, Mr. Zelensky, the president, uh, actually losing his power now and his popularity uh, and support from Ukrainian people so much. Uh, so, uh, the, uh, I think, uh, according to my analysis, the most uh, reasons for uh, this uh, risk of Russian revanche in Ukraine is um, uh, not really a progress with uh, uh, anti-corruption reform. So, formally, we have anti-corruption institutions, but they are not uh, working really efficient because uh, these institutions having attacks from the corrupted member of, members of parliament. And um, uh, actually the cases uh, are in the process, uh, but not finished and actually it's disappointing. Also it's a sabotage of the reforms uh, from 2014. Um, I'm as a member of the government from that time. I can see that uh, actually uh, the president Poroshenko at that time also declared a lot of reforms and started, but uh, uh, they're not finished yet and the people don't see uh, so much results. And uh, President Zelensky was a lot of hope for him, but now uh, people are disappointed because uh, a lot of things was promised, but not so much done. In the beginning, it was uh, getting well, so many reforms been approved, but now it's just stuck. So uh, also economic situation is uh, difficult, uh, not only because of the virus, um, but also uh, people getting more uh, poor because of uh, utilities um, uh, prices in Ukraine. 
uh, it should be uh, it was a reform to open the market um, uh, but um, uh, the government is really um, have luck it didn't provide the uh, honest competition uh, for the suppliers and uh, it's uh, also in the oligarchs hands in the end and people are paying uh, for the utilities more and more each day and of course uh, it's not really um, not getting more pop popularity for the president and his uh, government at the moment so now we're facing in ukraine a huge risk of political crisis and a lot of will depends uh, depend on um, policies of president zelensky and uh, in this case it's very important support of uh, Amer uh, us and eu partners and um, i think it's very good news that mr uh, biden won the elections and uh, hopefully it will be more help uh, for ukrainian democracy I think um, this crisis with the Constitutional Court in Ukraine will show uh, to the president that he should uh, do uh, a choice. Uh, uh, you, uh, that he should stay on bright side uh, uh, because uh, you cannot be on both sides. So, uh, and hopefully um, Mr. Biden could uh, help Zelensky actually to fight corruption, to complete the judicial reform. Uh, and uh, actually uh, provide competitive uh, requirements for the energy market in Ukraine and electricity market because um, this is very important because each person in Ukraine, especially old people, are really suffering from the poverty that they have to pay most of their money for to cover utility costs. So it's very important. Uh, so it's very important support of European Union now, and uh, I, I know now the revision of um, association agreement uh, is quite taking quite long. Uh, as I remember, it's already one year. I think it's important to for Ukraine to complete its obli obligations as soon as possible. So uh, there is a, there is of, of course the other scenario. So if it's um, um, I think it was similar. Uh, after the Orange Revolution, when Yushchenko compromised with Yanukovych, then Mr. Zelensky could compromise with uh, pro-Russian forces in Ukraine, for example, with Mr. Medvedchuk, that, that he is the most evident face of Kremlin in Ukraine, mostly. So then it could be the pro-Russian next president or parliament. So there is a huge risk and actually policy of Mr. Zelensky now, uh, in my opinion, is extremely important and international support in this case for Ukraine is a key uh, to make a right choice. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Hopefully it was informative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandra. Uh, now we have to switch to the panel. And I want to start with Ilya about what's going on, what can be the can consequences of these election, US elections on Russia, then you have uh, well, three minutes to explain. <laughs> <laughs> Just three minutes, you know, it's, it should be shortly in 40 minutes. Thank you, Olivia, for organizing this wonderful event. So it's uh, such a uh, brilliant set of uh, panelists. I think it's actually very important that we discuss uh, all our issues uh, together because at the end of the day, uh, uh, both uh, Ukraine and Belarus and Russia in future, we, we all are part of Europe and we all are part of one space and it has to be a coordinated policy and uh, uh, where should we start if not uh, within the uh, civil society and uh, the political groups uh, uh, to have this uh, coordination and to support each other uh, during difficult times, uh, which we all from time to time have, and uh, especially like our Belarusian friends now. So uh, speaking about uh, American elections, uh, I uh, don't share Alexandra's uh, enthusiasm about Mr. Biden, uh, despite that uh, he's a great, great guy and a good friend, uh, uh, and we know each other for ages. Uh, uh, and he really is uh, very friendly towards Ukraine, and he doesn't, doesn't like Putin, and he has all the right ideas, just that we have the track record in the past uh, 
uh, which showed to us that uh, under uh, democratic administrations, uh, uh, the actions are not that uh, swift and uh, decisions. Uh, decisive. And uh, uh, that's unfortunately the reality that we have to uh, face and have to be prepared uh, to work with. And uh, based on the personalities that we currently see uh, uh, as the candidates uh, in the new administration, and by the way, I want to say and uh, <laughs> warn everyone that uh, I being in the United States, I think that the situation is far from being over. I think that uh, the uh, fight in courts would uh, continue for at least another month. Uh, and maybe two, and uh, uh, despite that most likely uh, Biden would prevail, um, I think that we shouldn't be in a hurry and jump in front of the train uh, before before the dust uh, uh, settles. But if uh, if it would be uh, uh, President Biden and, uh, and his team, uh, we know these people for a very long time, and we know that uh, uh, the initiative should be in our hands. Uh, we should be proposing the solutions, uh, we should be proposing uh, the actions, we should be proposing the plans and uh, uh, help our American plans, uh, friends to find uh, uh, a feasible uh, way forward uh, that would be coordinated with uh, Ukraine, with uh, Belarus uh, and with the uh, European Union. But I don't think that we should expect that thing would uh, just happen by themselves and uh, somebody from Washington, D.C. would uh, fly to Kiev uh, in, in a nice blue helicopter and would fix the problem with the corruption and would tell Mr. Zelensky what to do. Firstly, I think it's, it's all wrong when the foreign government dictates you what to do. Uh, but it, it would not be happening anyway. Thank you. Thank you, Ilya. Now I want to give the floor to Pavel. Pavel, what do you think about the situation in Ukraine and what they can be the consequences of the election of Biden? Uh, good evening again. It's, uh, it's great to be in, uh, you know, in such a good company. Uh, look, uh, firstly, I like the title of uh, of our event, uh, and uh, it's uh, it's funny that uh, actually the answer to call what is uh, to uh, to Russia, us, and Belarus uh, is now quite different. We can't uh, find uh, any parallel track in the sense of trying to uh, answer these questions for free countries and especially free free societies. Despite, despite very famous Putin uh, topic about, uh, you know, the same people and all kind of stuff. Uh, my second point, uh, uh, look, uh, as you probably know, I am a physicist by education. Many, many years ago, one of my professors told me a joke about uh, Albert Einstein teaching uh, in the Zurich uh, University. And uh, he had an exam uh, in physics, uh, distributed different tests uh, among uh, the students. And one of the students raised uh, his hand, uh, basically wavering and said, but professors, uh, pro professor, these are the same tests we had two years ago. And Einstein said, fine, but the answers are different. So my simple point, the answers are different now. Uh, you know, can you imagine uh, the sort of what's going on in Belarus one year ago? Uh, it, it was quite a speculation for many people. Can you imagine what's going on in Russia one year ago, despite any sort of uh, coronavirus, uh, coronavirus development? So my point, uh, the answers uh, to the issue is quite, uh, you know, are quite different from the very simple time, uh, one, uh, one year on. My third point, I believe uh, still uh, that uh, Joseph Biden and uh, his administration would make uh, a better option uh, for Ukraine. And I'm gonna tell you why, because uh, I know personally both uh, Biden and Trump, and I know a lot of people from uh, from, uh, let's say, their teams, uh, although to say that uh, Donald Trump uh, has a sort of uh, clear-cut team is, uh, is a bit of a joke. Anyway, 
look, uh, I believe uh, that firstly, Biden has uh, a sort of uh, positive emotion uh, about Ukraine. It's there. It could be mixed, but it's there. And it's uh, completely different in the case of Donald Trump after, after failed impeachment procedure and uh, a lot of stuff and basically his take about Ukraine. And he believes the Ukraine is a sort of uh, corrupt reality, which is difficult uh, to manage or to change. And we know it from different sources. The second point, uh, a common effort, and uh, what is even more important, uh, sort of common uh, success in supporting our, our drive, our momentum uh, in reform agenda would be the best way to answer all kinds of speculation around uh, Biden's son, Hunter, and Burisma, and all kinds of uh, this uh, crazy stuff. Simply a kind of answer. Let's go forward. Let's deliver. Let's pull it off. Uh, it's, it's really uh, the best way we can, we can get here. Uh, so I believe uh, that uh, a sort of personal engagement, and in the U.S. system, it's important to have a personal engagement from the, uh, from, uh, from the president, should be there. In what way, uh, we could discuss it further. It's a, it's a funny issue, but, uh, but still. And last but not least, uh, this, uh, let's call it a foreign policy dimension. Uh, you know, uh, and there is a almost a proverb in Russia about, uh, about the Democrats, that uh, the Democrats uh, are easy to talk to, but far more difficult uh, to get an agreement uh, with. And uh, well, uh, it's not completely true for all kind of my experience, but it's close to being uh, true. And the Democrats are really good in enacting everybody around, not just uh, transactionally head of states or governments, but basically business, civil society, everybody. They are good in their complex approach. And this kind of approach could be far more effective uh, with Russia. And what's going on in Belarus, you know, has been becoming a sort of embarrassment even for Putin. At the, at the backdrop of Lukashenko, even Putin is somehow, you know, sort of our autocrat, but still, uh, you know, uh, makes a difference uh, to Lukashenko. So uh, now uh, Lukashenko, for me, has been becoming sort of burden for Putin, and Putin is ready for trade-off with Lukashenko, somehow preparing this trade-off uh, with the new administration and with the European Union. So it's going to come. But unfortunately for our Belarusian friends uh, who have been fighting on the streets of, uh, of uh, Belarusian cities, it's, <clears throat> it's, it's never enough. But uh, let me again uh, say that I salute and applaud everybody. And I have a lot of friends in Belarus, and it's going to come. We, we simply have to pull it off. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's not obvious for everybody who is... Uh, on the, on the streets now, but, uh, but still. So, uh, you know, cutting it short, uh, I believe uh, that after the US elections, uh, or better to say, after the inauguration, we're gonna have sort of different, uh, sort of different momentum. And uh, in a way, I agree with uh, Ilya. It's, it, in the, at the end of the day, it's about us to deliver. It's about us to get, uh, to get forward. Uh, but the kind of good and friendly assistance does matter. So thanks a lot. And uh, it's, it's good to be in such, a, in such a great company. Sorry, I'm going to switch my video off because the connection is uh, it's, it's not ideal, but uh, in the sense of uh, sound communication, uh, I'm there, I'm, uh, I'm with you. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Pavlo. Uh, I know you speak French also. Um, then, uh, merci beaucoup, Pavlo. Then now I want to give the floor to Marie, Marie from The Independent. Uh, bonjour, I know you speak French also because you were in Paris. 
then uh, then I, I give uh, to you the floor. You you know very well this part of Europe. Then I think you will have to say a lot of things. <laughs> There's so many things I'd like to say, um, but first I'd really like to add to the congratulations to the uh, to the women of Belarus, um, and also to say that um, I'm deeply envious of everybody who was there. I would love to be there rather than here, um, and the ingenuity, um, the sheer style, and verve that the women's campaign has shown has been just completely spectacular and I think that singled it out um, and it has really put Belarus on the map in a very positive way. Um, as a general point, um, I think I'm really, maybe it's the privilege of being an outsider, um, but I'm rather more optimistic um, than most of our speakers uh, so far. And that's not about the, uh, the results of the American election. That's about what I've been observing over the last few years, whether it's in Ukraine or in Belarus, or even, dare I say, in Russia. I think it's very easy to underestimate um, how long the sort of change that people are demanding today, how long that takes. And you, know, you look back um, you know, 30 years practically since the collapse of the Soviet Union and you say, well, why isn't the full democracy in places like Ukraine, Belarus and in Russia? I think the process just takes a very, very long time. But also if you look back to how things were then, 30 years, 20 years, even 10 years ago. Still, I think that in general, things are better. And when you talk about, you know, I know that there were some um, very pessimistic and negative comments about um, the situation of the media and human rights in Russia, if we take, as it were, the worst case. Nonetheless, there are things that, that the internet in Russia is pretty free. We saw the, the, uh, the, the, the demonstrations and the protests in Khabarovsk in the Far East, as far as you could get from Moscow. And we saw the really spectacular um, examples of uh, what's possible with social media when you saw people in Khabarovsk with banners hailing what was going on in Belarus. Um, that sort of thing would have been completely unimaginable. Um, and I think that means that, you know, you may be impatient, we're all impatient for change to happen, but the idea that things are lost, that things are going backwards, I don't think that's true. I'd like to say one thing specifically about Ukraine. I spent quite a lot of time in Ukraine um, during the last campaign for the presidency. And I traveled over quite a lot of Ukraine. I've been there a lot before, um, including in Soviet times, including over the last 10 years. Um, and I have to say that I am an, op I am an incorrigible optimist about Ukraine. Um, I think when um, some of the questions and the talking points that we were sent for this session um, said sort of, when is there going to be in democracy in places like Ukraine and Belarus and Russia? I would say that Ukraine has gone an awful long way towards democracy. That the last presidential and the last local elections they were an example of a campaign conducted right across the country where there was open campaigning, where there was a candidate in Zelensky who had come from outside, who had no track record in politics, who was elected by a big majority right across the country, a country which has supposed to be, and you know, I've seen in the not too distant past, how it was divided pretty much down the middle it's not divided down the middle anymore. Um, it's much more politically homogenous. And even though I know we, we've heard um, evidence from the local elections that there is some um, maybe retreat of the um, Zelensky party, um, especially in the eastern part of the country. Um, but 
I think what you're, what, what you're getting is a true reflection of um, opinion in Ukraine. And that that's not far from democracy. I don't think people should be dissatisfied with that. Where I'm disappointed with Ukraine is not actually in the various crises that are being fought now, um, but in what seemed to me the very lukewarm and lack of enthusiasm um, for the results of the last presidential election in Ukraine. Um, I think um, Zelensky was right to feel disappointed that he didn't get um, a full dress summit with the President of the United States. Um, and I hope maybe he gets he, he gets one with President Biden because it's it's not about the actual meeting and what may be discussed. It's about the symbolism and it's about the approval and support that those sort of meetings generate and show to the people back home. I was equally disappointed, um, maybe in some ways more disappointed, that um, Zelensky and his wife came to, came to Britain. They came to London three or four weeks ago. It was a visit that was hardly reported in the British press that was hardly projected or promoted by the British government until it was over and the Zelenskys had gone home. I thought that was not just disappointing, it was outrageous. Um, here was the leader of a country who'd won a democratic election, to my mind, um, who could benefit from this sort of support. I'm not talking about um, interference in other people's internal affairs. I agree with everybody else who said, you know, countries must stand by themselves. Reforms must come from within. They must be supported from within. Um, but the, 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 the visual moral support that comes from other countries' leaders saying, yes, either we approve of what's been doing, we recognize the achievements of this leader and this country. I find that very disappointing. Um, and I think the, the European Union was guilty as well, um, that we've campaigned for so long for democracy and democratic elections. And when these happen, not to be enthusiastic enough about the results, I think doesn't reflect very well on us. So I think maybe I'll leave that as my remarks for the moment. Merci beaucoup, Marie. Merci, Merci. beaucoup. Uh, now I want to go uh, to the round table. Uh, I will ask everybody to speak two or three minutes because I want a debate and questions after uh, between us. Uh, then I will give the floor to Katerina Odashenko from Ukraine. Yeah, thank you, Olivier, and thank you for invitation to um, this conference. Um, firstly, my deep respect uh, to people from Belarus, uh, because it's uh, really hard to live in an authoritarian regime yeah, and uh, to live without uh, also political institution. And uh, on, my, uh, on my point of view, um, we have a very similar problem, but with different uh, deepest in this problem. We haven't uh, developed a political institution, no in Ukraine, no in Russia, no in Belarus. Uh, of course, in Belarus, it's like authoritarian mm, regime and uh, monopoly of uh, one, one leader and group who um, uh, live near this leader. In Russia, um, it's also monopoly of uh, leader Putin and his group, uh, in Russia. And in Ukraine, it's uh, monopoly of oligarchs, but every monopoly, um, every monopoly also give to us no opportunity to build a um, political institution. And, um, and as for me, it, it's, it's, a, it's a really big problem. If we are talking about um, American election and so for this week, uh, all, all this week, uh, I also taken part in difficult, different conversation on TV, about influence of this American election, I think that uh, it's uh, not not help us, for example, for uh, some budgeting or for fighting this corruption. Um, and I talk to you why. Uh, this year I have um, 
uh, meeting with Mr. Caputo, he is advisor of Mr. Trump, and he for a long time, for seven years, worked uh, uh, in uh, Russia. Then he worked uh, in Ukraine, and uh, he's quite experienced as a person as a political manager also. And he said that uh, the most, uh, the biggest problem in Ukraine, um, and uh, also with um, our negotiation um, within the US uh, and Ukraine, it's our image as corrupted country. And with the Biden case, we also um, do some impulse to this image of corrupted country country. And uh, also of uh, his point of view, of point of view of Michael Caputo, um, um, he, uh, we need more than five years to change this reputation because uh, every American person understands that, oh, Ukraine is a country where you have corruption and where you, where you have not strong power. And um, I um, also must um, I must agree with my colleagues who are talking about Russian influence in Ukraine. I think it's the same process, um, like hybrid war, um, like in Moldova, like in Georgia, um, uh, when uh, Russia give money to different political forces and different media to um, have more influence uh, in uh, in, in hybrid war. Um, and uh, even uh, Georgia, even Moldova, even Ukraine, uh, on my point of view, can't uh, develop um, in, in right way with this Russian influence. And um, I also, um, and, and the ending, uh, must uh, maybe show one our case and maybe Olivia know about, about it. It's also about fighting and uh, women's fighting and fighting against um, administrative pressure. Um, I work, uh, as I mentioned, for eight years in political management. And this year we also um, want um, and we start to create our political force in Ukraine. And we collect uh, 13,000 uh, signatures all over Ukraine. I, I can do this and I organize all these protests in, in our country. And when we uh, go to Ministry of Justice, they um, want uh, uh, to take some bribes and uh, we must to do demonstration against uh, this administrative pressure uh, to new political forces. That's why, of course, in Ukraine and on my own experience, I can say to you that, of course, in Ukraine, we have better situation than in Belarus. Yeah, of course, we have better. And that's why we can organize Maidan, um, as civil, we as civil society can organize Maidan and uh, we fight for our values and we fight for our sovereign um, way and of course uh, sovereign European way. But, uh, but we still have, uh, um, uh, but, uh, I'm sorry, uh, but we still have uh, corruption in the country and we still have problem of uh, political political pressure. And I think not the um, United States of America can help uh, us, uh, us as uh, Belarus, as Ukraine, as Moldova, as Georgia, uh, to build strong political institution, but only our, our activity. If we will organize conferences, if we will organize political parties, NGOs, associations, uh, free media. We will help um, our country to develop in really European way. And uh, we will help uh, um, also to, to create here European values and of course the European quality of life. So thank you one more time. And um, uh, we also met with uh, Mrs. Marie and Europe, uh, Brussels Press Club sometime. And, uh, um, I appreciate also your help to all women who work in policy and, of course, to, to women of Belarus, it's, it's a very important issue and everybody in the world must know about abusing of human rights and political rights, of course. Merci beaucoup, Catherine. Thank you very much, Catherine. And now I want to give the floor to Christophe from Strasbourg. You will speak about uh, our problem of elections in Europe, Europe and Western Europe. Yeah, that's a big deal, Olivier, because uh, I have to make a link between two different things. 
the thing is, I mean, very sim simply, we observe uh, rise for more democracy on Eastern countries, European Eastern countries, while we are fighting for or against rise of populism in Western Europe. So the question is, which lesson can we learn from uh, the EU? Um, as I said, we have a rise of populist parties in Europe. Question is, of course, why and how? Are the people deceived or afraid of the EU? Is it only because of the strong emerging role of fake news factories, for example, or anti-EU militants uh, on social networks? We have that phenomenon in Western Europe. This will be for sure very simple to summarize it that way. But EU is mostly perceived now like an economic and financial market. That's a fact within the populations. And that only profits, according to many people, only to few people. EU is also seen by the people like a very small worldwide actor on geopolitical on geopolitical matters. I mean, Armenia is a very good example. I mean, we had the declaration of Emmanuel Macron about we will save Armenia, we will support this country, and we know what it gave. Uh, and yes, the EU is uh, still seen as a technocrat, technocratic structure from many citizens too. And this is, of course, not helpful to go to more democracy and to more European citizenship and to bring the people towards a better EU on model for some other countries. But what is nowadays the common vision of the EU to be said of the 27 member states? Honestly, there is none. What means EU citizenship? Is that only passport, Erasmus, Schengen, etc.? Okay, that's part of it. But what is the role of the citizens in the building of uh, politics in Europe? Of course, we have the European Parliament, but the reality is that even if we do elect a European Parliament, the power is in the hands of the national governments on any level. I mean, they propose, they decide, and they co-legislate with the European Parliament. So European Parliament is a key actor which, ga which gained lots of powers uh, during the past decades. But uh, the thing is that it has no real parliamentary powers, I mean, in the strong meaning of the word. And that's also a problem. Third problem, uh, are the EU members really pro-European? That's really complicated because all the talks coming from any government is we need more Europe, we need to build a strong Europe. But in a reality, when there is a European policy that goes on the advantage, they say, hey, yeah, guys, we won. And we won within the EU. So that's France, for example, who won something. And if the people in the country complain, that's never because of the national government. It's always because of Brussels. The CAP, so the Common Agricultural Policy, is a wonderful example about that. Because nobody, no journalist, and I was, I used to be a journalist, is asking about, hey guys, but who did sign the agreement? That's the member state. And when things go wrong, it's always a fault of Europe. When things go well, it's always thanks to the national level. And there is also uh, the media, which are a very, very big problem in Europe. Question is not about uh, the media do agree or not with the EU decision. The question is much more about covering EU issues, explaining, explaining to the people what's going on what is done. I mean, this work is done in some countries like Germany, you can have real uh, reports on the media and even on a TV media. But in France, it is absolutely not done. All the people speaking on the media on, on TV are people who never went to Strasbourg, Brussels or Luxembourg. And they have no 
interest for EU questions. And that brings a lack of knowledge about Europe and the big path for the populist parties. We can enter that, uh, that uh, emptiness. So how in such uh, painting can people still support the EU and defend it against populism and the rise of populism? Because there is, as I said, it no vision, no strong citizenship. Uh, we have a light of strong nationalism in Europe. I mean, Emmanuel Macron, for me personally, is kind of light nationalism because he's nationalist. And uh, there is a lack of information on these are real big issues there. But we have to add two other points which are really important and that can help some other countries to think about the future. First, the way the EU election have been settled. EU election uh, are a net of national elections. That's not an EU election. You don't have transnational program. You don't have transnational party during the elections. So this is the result from France plus Germany plus Belgium, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That makes the European Parliament. And the rules are even not the same to get elected. For example, the difference between Germany and France. In Germany, you can have a deputy with maybe one percent of the votes. That was the case for uh, an MEP coming from the Volt Party which is a citizen party um, on the next elections. So you have, that, you have that problem first, but people say, yes, but that could be like in the US. Yeah, of course, but in the US, uh, the candidate has its own program, defends that program or the program of its party. And that's not the same in the Europe. We could have that chance with the, with the Spitzenkandidaten that was, an interesting step toward more uh, European uh, elections or a European way to, to, to elect the people. But the member states did completely disapprove that. I mean, von der Leyen is not, was not a Spitzenkandidat. So the Spitzenkandidat have been put away and that's also a problem. And the second point, because I think it's the main point. We, we all not only in the EU, but also, uh, also uh, in the in the US, uh, a new. I don't know if you hear me because I mean it's uh, it's freezing. Uh, Do you hear me, Olivier? Yes, I have some problem, excuse me. Olivier? Hello, oui, no, I, some problem with internet. You hear me? But we, we do hear you both, guys. Okay, let's go. Then, Christophe, can you finish, please? Do you hear me or not? Yeah, yes. yes I will. So I don't know where that. So the last point was, and that is very important for countries, for example, like Ukraine, I guess, is that we observe um, a new phenomenon uh, where you have a different vote, whether you live in big urban centers, big cities, or whether you live in periphery or countryside. I mean, in Europe or in the US, for example, when you live in big cities, democratic parties have much more power. If you are in the countryside, conservative or populist parties have power. And this is mostly due uh, to the digital, um, to the digital natives who live in urban centers, big urban centers. For example, if you take the, the, the last map of the US, if you just choose the big cities, you will have a pro-Biden vote. I mean, the card, the, the US card will be blue. If you uh, take only the countryside, the card is red. 
In France, it's about the same with, with, between Rassemblement National and Democratic parties. It could be also the same for the Brexit. Brexit, when you have a look at the votes, so populist parties, populist leaders make better votes in a disindustrialized uh, parts of the country or in the countryside or by the fisheries. While they make some very low score, the populist in big cities like London, which was completely against the Brexit. So, and this brings something very important to, to, to have in mind is if you want to go to one more democracy, more citizenship, more open society, let's say it's that way, you have to combine two things, a real strong vision, but that integrates both the cities on the countryside, which means that you have to join those two kinds of population. And uh, on the second one, I completely forgot because I'm lost with the, <laughs> with the, pro the technical problems, but you need that vision and you need to bring the people together and for example, Maiden on Kiev, I'm not a specialist of, on Ukraine, but Maiden was in Kiev. So I'm not sure that all Ukraine is Kiev in the way they are thinking. In, Be in uh, Belarus, I'm not sure that all Belarus is Minsk. Yeah. And we have to put the people together to fight against rise of populism. And that is really important. And bring a vision, common vision to them. And that's a very difficult thing to, to bring. So I can ask some more questions after if you want, but um, I will. Merci. Thank uh, you. Thank you very much, Christophe. That was very analytic. It was like a conference of Sciences Po Paris, <laughs> but uh, very interesting also. Uh, now I have to give the floor to our, our professor from UK, Bill um to explain your point of view from uk you are an academic you have the floor bill so i'm uh, primarily a human rights lawyer actually and so that's what i've been doing in uh, ukraine russia and belarus like mary i'm an optimist and i'll say a couple of words uh, why uh, Mary is also a contrarian. I am quite often as well, so we have that in common too. Um, first of all, I have uh, I want to thank uh, Roger for setting up this uh, really excellent uh, <clears throat> session, and also my congratulations to Olga Zubrilova and the women of Belarus for the award uh, this evening. On that note, I want to bring you two lots of greetings. Uh, first is from the uh, Belarus International Committee, which has been set up in London. Uh, it's being led by Baroness Helena Kennedy, who is a quite well-known uh, human rights lawyer and a member of the House of Lords in London. And she's very active on this issue as she is on others. And we have uh, on this um, uh, committee people from Belarus and Belarusians who are in England. And uh, with uh, my colleague, I represent the Bar Human Rights Committee of England and Wales. And we also are taking as active steps as we can in relation to what's happening. And one of the issues that we were discussing at our meeting yesterday, in fact, was the question of uh, Magnitsky sanctions which uh, where uh, the UK appears now to be following the path uh, set by Bill Browder in getting the United States to adopt Magnitsky sanctions against the uh, murderers of Magnitsky in Russia. Canada has followed suit and it looks as if the UK may well do as well. So there may be a question about uh, targeted sanctions against people guilty of really egregious uh, human rights violations. That's one thing that is going on. Uh, the other one, as noted in the um, program for this evening, is the, uh, the European Lawyers for Democracy and Human Rights, um, which is a totally voluntary network. Um, I'm the president, and we are in 21 European countries, including Russia and Ukraine. 
And one of the reasons I'm an optimist for Russia is that the unexpected always happens in Russia. Uh, that is guaranteed. Nobody could have predicted the huge crowds out every day in Khabarovsk and the fact that there would be the link up with uh, Belarus, totally unpredictable. Uh, the fact that Furgal, who uh, was uh, the elected uh, candidate of the Liberal Democrats of Russia, uh, an extreme right wing party, nonetheless, he's become a local hero. That could not have been predicted. And our own uh, members in Russia are the uh, lawyers for workers' rights who work with the independent trade unions, who have several million members across Russia. Uh, they can't go on strike, but they do Italian strikes uh, as the workers in Belarus are doing at the present moment. We were hearing last night. An Italian strike, for those who are new to this concept, is a work to rule. Um, so you work strictly according to your contract to no more, and everything grinds to a halt. So that is what is happening in Belarus and happening actually all across uh, Russia. And I'm, I just mentioned the Magnitsky sanctions. I'm actually myself always opposed to intervention from outside. And I'm absolutely confident that the people of Russia and the people of Ukraine and the people of Belarus can sort themselves out. And one can see many signs. I mean, the heroic women in Belarus, I, I would say uh, the fact that Ukraine is massively complicated, but there is actually a kind of democracy and very much a, a free media. And uh, Mary uh, mentioned the internet in Russia. Now we're all of us communicating by telegram signal, etc. And there's really a big network of uh, like-minded people all the way across Russia um, who are not asking for the um, aircraft carriers and the planes to arrive or the rockets. I, I think what we're doing is trying to set up the most productive networks with like-minded people in those countries. And something to mention, you so of course I'm speaking from the UK where the Johnson regime appears to be in deep trouble at the present moment with his fiance leading the charge against his closest um, confidants. Really quite extraordinary uh, the last two days. So uh, my country is also, also um, uh, very hard to predict. One thing I will say before closing though, is that uh, as I say, I'm a human rights lawyer, so I'm taking cases to the European Court of Human Rights against Russia in particular, but also against Ukraine. We can't against Belarus because it's not in the system. Uh, many cases against Russia. And actually, Russia 98% of the time complies. Many laws change as a result of uh, losing cases at Strasbourg. Um, every judgment of the Constitutional Court of the Russian Federation contains references to the case law of Strasbourg and it looks like Putin's constitutional reforms are actually not going to affect that a huge amount. My prediction is that the United Kingdom, or as it may well be, not too distant future, the former United Kingdom um, will be the first to leave the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, if one listens to Mrs. May, to Mr. Johnson and to others, and actually the Russia, strangely enough, will stay in there as will Ukraine. So on that cheerful note, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now I want to give the floor to Anna from La Stampa, newspaper from Italia. Anna, I know you know very well Russia and I think you will do a nice speech about what's going on. Thank you. Um, I'm... I was listening uh, with a great interest uh, uh, the um, the uh, the speakers that precede me because um, because there is there is a lot to say about all this situation. I would like to concentrate on one point uh, which uh, um, uh, um, uh, both Pavlo and Ilya mentioned that uh, this this kind of uh, diplomacy rule, which is very 
uh, very popular in uh, in Russia and also in Ukraine that is uh, for Moscow but also for Kiev it's easier to deal with the uh, Republicans than with Democrats because Republicans are more pragmatic, uh, maybe less uh, committed to human rights, eh? but uh, they are they go straight to the to the business. Uh, I think we mm, we have to understand uh, uh, that uh, this is a kind of tradition which goes back to all the way to Nixon, uh, Richard Nixon. Uh, today, the mm, Democrats and Republicans are very different, right? And we uh, left are very different. All has changed. I ha I'm a um, little bit more optimistic about what Joe Biden will do because uh, because he has, uh, you know, he has to prove he's not Trump. Uh, so it's not only because uh, uh, Mr. Biden was already uh, um, in charge of a U Ukraine dossier in uh, Obama's administration. Uh, not only because uh, uh, his, uh, uh, it, it was the uh, request from uh, Mr. Trump to uh, uh, inquire in his son's business in Kiev that started the, the impeachment, but it's also uh, it's also because you know a lot uh, the um, Biden's agenda is first of all do doing what Trump did not, so I can expect more attention to Ukraine also because having less attention it's it's hard and uh, I'm uh, I'm expecting uh, a Navalny's list because uh, uh, it, uh, it was one of um, maybe I don't know if not the first time it was one of the few times when European Union was ahead in sanctions again against Moscow uh, while uh, U.S. Uh, were ignoring the uh, Nav Nav Navalny poison, um, poison So uh, I think uh, uh, there will be a lot of attention from Mr. Biden to this kind of dossiers, human rights, opposition, free, freedom of speech. Uh, I hope it will be also for Belarus uh, because uh, until now Belarus was not so much on the map of uh, the way, uh, for White House. Uh, current administration, um, what will, uh, uh, will they do? What can they do? It's another, it's another question and we will see because of course, uh, uh, Mr. Biden has also to do a lot uh, at, at home. First of all, at home, because um, he has to rebuild uh, enter, uh, enter pieces of, uh, of the uh, political system. But I'm I'm more more optimistic about thinking that at least uh, there will be there will be harder for uh, for Moscow for to do some things and it will be easier for Kiev and for Be Belarusian opposition to do uh, to do something and another uh, dossier which is very very important and I hope and I'm sure uh, Mr. Biden will will uh, reopen it's the the, the uh, arm control because uh, after what uh, Trump and Putin did in the last four years uh, uh, we have uh, just one uh, uh, strategical treaty of the treaties uh, we, which were uh, signed in the uh, last decades we have just one treaty remain it would start uh, the start treaty uh, limiting the uh, uh, Russian and American nuclear arsenals. So this is another urgent thing to do because these treaties uh, um, has to expire in uh, uh, February of 21. And so we have just a few months to start, at least to start new talks. Uh, that's, uh, that's what I think, that's, that's maybe also what I hope. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Anna. Now I will give the floor to Andreas. Thank you, Oliver. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes. yes. Um, yeah, I'm very grateful to be invited here. I just want to maybe briefly comment on the uh, new president in the US and the transition and then also turn back to, to Bel Belarus. So what um, I'm fearing here is that uh, what we've just all said about Biden and the Democrats and so on, and 
um, the largely, as I see it, uh, positive outlook um, that a Biden, a Biden presidency means for Ukraine, at least that's how I see it. And I gathered some others here see the same way. Um, I'm afraid is also seen this way in, in Russia. And I don't know what Ilya and, um, and others uh, who have studied that perhaps more than myself uh, think about it. I'm afraid that the transition period now will become uh, difficult and that Russia may uh, try to um, sort of spoil uh, the, the start of the new presidency that um, Russia will um, will try to um, to use, uh, for instance, instability in the U.S. Um, to um, to weaken the U.S., especially during during the transition period. So, um, we uh, Pavlo and myself we have published an article about the, the, these fears. I hope uh, we are too pessimistic here. I hope perhaps um, the people in Moscow will not be as aggressive as we suspect them perhaps being and that we will get, go through this period more or less um, in a more or less orderly way and that Russia will not get uh, in the way of the transition. Um, but uh, we have been uh, negatively surprised by Russia uh, several times uh, over the last, uh, well, 15 years in Georgia, in Ukraine, in Syria, um, during the 2016 presidential elections and so on. And uh, we may still be here in for a negative surprise. But I want to uh, go back to the beginning of our session and uh, briefly comment on Belarus also from my point of view. I think actually from the three countries that we are dealing here with, um, <clears throat> Belarus, Ukraine and Russia, in a way I think Belarus is the most important one. Um, although it's the smallest one, I think uh, Belarus has... Um, an enormous um, uh, meaning for <clears throat> this whole interpretation of, um, uh, of this sort of post-Soviet sphere, because unlike Ukraine or Georgia, Belarus has until recently been a staunch ally of Russia. Um, it has a, a security organ that is still called the KGB. Um, uh, it is a member of the um, Eurasian Economic Union, the uh, is, um, the sec uh, Collective Security Treaty Organization, and it has actually a ratified union treaty with Russia uh, signed, I think, not by accident, on the 8th of December 1999, when uh, Vladimir Putin was still um, prime minister. And the 8th of December is, of course, uh, the date of the Belarus Agreement of 1991. And I don't think it was a um, by accident that on the 8th of December of 1999, the uh, Union Treaty um, was between Belarus and, um, uh, and Russia was, uh, was signed. Um, by the way, the, the CSTO Treaty um, that transformed the um, collective tr um, treaty, um, uh, the collective security treaty into an organization was signed on the 15th um, a birthday of Vladimir Putin on 7th of October 2002. So, so all of this is very important uh, for Putin and uh, therefore I think Belarus is ex extremely important here in this whole constellation and the future of Belarus is extremely important. I think also for the Western interpretation of what we are observing in the post-Soviet sphere, Belarus is rather important. Uh, because um, we are in our little bubble here where we all know that um, these things that have been happening during the last years in, in Ukraine, in Belarus, in, um, in Russia, in Georgia, and so on, they have to do a lot with the domestic situation in these countries. But I'm afraid the majority of the uh, Western observers of these events think that um, the conflicts that we are in now in Ukraine, in Georgia, they have to do something with the West and that the EU has made uh, mistakes, that NATO has made mistakes, that George Soros has gotten into you know, the post-Soviet sphere, that Obama is guilty of uh, the Crimea annexation or something like that. And um, that was until recently, and I think still is a very popular narrative but now we have a country um, where, uh, with Belarus, a country where it is very difficult to assert that the EU has taken much action here. And Belarus is not even a member of the Council of Europe. Uh, 
uh, Belarus has not applied for NATO membership, uh, does not have very good relations with the EU even, um, and um, it's, uh, as I said, a staunch ally of Russia. And nevertheless, we have now an uprising that at least um, from the outside, if you look at the uh, at the scenes, uh, looks actually very similar to the, um, in, some, in some regards to the Orange Revolution of 2004 and other regards to the Euromaidan Revolution of 2013, 2014. And that I would say is also, uh, that should play a large role in the reinterpretation of this whole uh, post-Soviet conflict zone, which has been, I think, over, overpopulated by, um, uh, well, geopoliticians who don't know much about the countries they're talking about, but who um, know a lot about geopolitics and international relations and um, always want to bring in the US and the EU and NATO and perhaps also some some Western oligarchs like uh, George Soros into into the game and um, and use then these these international actors to explain what we are seeing in the post-Soviet sphere. In Belarus, clearly, that is not the case. That cannot be the case uh, if you have a, a security organ that is called uh, the KGB. And therefore, I think uh, both internally within the um, uh, sort of neo-Soviet little empire that um, uh, Putin has created, and also for the Western interpretation of um, all of these conflicts, uh, Belarus is actually um, key. And maybe I'll stop at that. Uh, thank you very much, Andres. We will uh, now finish uh, this uh, room table with uh, Wolfgang. Wolfgang from Germany. Uh, you want to speak, Wolfgang, about Armenia? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Olivier. Yeah, uh, good evening. Yeah, I want to say some words about Armenia because I think uh, the things Belarus, the whole democratic uh, situation in Ukraine too, we heard the influence of Russia is raising in Ukraine as a result of the elections. Uh, we have also one thesis is that the Belarus uh, democratic movement is a danger for Putin in a long-term way, but at the moment, uh, Putin uh, has Lukashenko in his hands and uh, has a lot of influence what's, uh, what will happen after Lukashenko. And in this way, uh, also the influence uh, of the Kreml, in my opinion, is growing or the danger uh, that the influence of uh, the Kreml is growing to the post-Soviet uh, countries. Uh, and the same situation we have in Armenia at the moment. And I'm a little surprised that uh, nobody uh, uh, in, uh, noticed really in Europe what had happened in, uh, in Armenia uh, and uh, uh, what that means. Um, uh, because we are responsible too, because this aggression against Armenia was relevant introduced by Turkey. Turkey is a member of NATO. And the effects of the ceasefire at the moment is that the Russian can send now 2,000 soldiers directly in the South Caucasus area. Uh, and that influences Georgia, the situation in Georgia, this influences the whole situation uh, to Iran and so on. And uh, this aggression of Turkey gives Russians a, a chance for rising up uh, their own uh, influence. And uh, I, I, want to, uh, I want to say the Minsk group where European, Western European influence is, uh, is in, is, uh, was uh, keeping off uh, this uh, development. So in my eyes, it should have been, and it should be the task of the EU and NATO to define red lines to Turkey too, to prevent more destabil uh, destabil uh, destabilization by neo osmanism which gives the Russians the chance uh, to play a more important role in the Soviet uh, uh, in the Soviet country. France uh, seems to understood this uh, danger rather clearly. What Macron uh, what Macron says. So, for me, the example in Armenia shows that even if there are political possibilities to support the democratic development in Yerevan after the silent uh, revolution, they were not used to prevent this aggression from. From Turkey and made this uh, new new role uh, of uh, of Russia possible. So from this point of view, the result of the war against Armenia will encourage Moscow to protect also Yugoshenko 
more against his own uh, his own people because it makes Putin stronger than he was uh, before. And this is a threat for the future, even for the existence of Armenia. When you see, when you have a look in the history of the genocide against the Armenians, uh, um, and this under the eyes of NATO and uh, and EU. And so I think if we want and this is the whole topic of our evening, to, this, to give peace and democracy in the middle and long-term run of change in the Eastern Partnership uh, states and in whole Europe, political courage is needed more than ever. We have to say some more clear words for democracy against uh, even in the uh, European Union, in the case of Poland, in the case of Hungary, in the case of NATO membership of uh, of Turkey and so on, and to to support really the democratic uh, the democratic powers and uh, that they believe in our values and not only listen uh, to our speeches uh, where we are holding up the values. That was one point of view I wanted to bring in this very important discussion and to say uh, at last uh, thank you very much for all and solidarity with the women and all of Belarus in our project. We often have uh, the chairman of the journalist organization of Belarus talking to each other, explaining the situation. And we know how hard this fight is too. So thank you very much that I can talk to you this evening. Merci beaucoup, Wolfgang. Thank you very much, Wolfgang. Now I want to come back to our panel and I want to come back to Alexandra, to Ilya, to our panel. What are your reactions uh, after this round table? Alexandra. Uh, I think uh, it was very interesting discussion and uh, actually I'm not losing my optimism. And <laughs> um, I think of course, um, uh, Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian people itself uh, should support the democracy in our country. But I think the support from international leaders is very important. Uh, uh, I know because uh, even during my work in, in the Ministry of Infrastructure, it was uh, actually uh, extremal support from U.S. Embassy being provided to the reforms, especially anti-corruption field. And I hope uh, it will be continued um, as Biden uh, actually elected, because now it's a little bit stuck. So uh, it was also very important. And I think it's difficult to understand the situation uh, in Ukraine uh, without uh, looking around uh, the other countries, because uh, uh, I see that uh, Russia and uh, Kremlin actually they have uh, its strategy and uh, to understand what happening in Ukraine I think it's good to look around and understand the situation in more uh, general uh, field and um, I think yes uh, probably this uh, I must uh, agree that uh, probably for Putin it's uh, danger Belarus is danger and uh, uh, Kremlin probably will be more aggressive uh, and in Ukraine uh, uh, I see that uh, uh, pro-Russian oligarchs are becoming more and more aggressive especially in media so we have uh, our media resources owned by pro-Russian oligarchs and rhetoric there it's it's absolutely anti-western propaganda is uh, going on uh, I, I couldn't remember even during Yanukovych time, it wasn't so uh, negative about uh, uh, about Western uh, on our TV, actually. <laughs> so hopefully it, it was very interesting discussion and I, I found a lot of interesting points and thank you for commenting and um, thank you. Merci beaucoup, Alexandra. I want to give the floor to Ilya and after to Pavlo. Ilya. Uh, I think that Olivier, you have done a great job by bringing us together because what I uh, uh, see for many years that uh, the right relations with uh, Russian authorities and Russian opposition with the West, 
there are relations with Ukrainian authorities and Ukrainian different flanks of opposition with the West. There are relations with Belarus opposition with the West and even between Lukashenko and the West. But there is no relationship uh, uh, at a sufficient level between uh, people of goodwill of uh, Ukraine, Belarus, and, and, and Russia. And I think that's what we really miss. And I think that, uh, thank you very much that uh, you have organized this. I think that we should especially intensify uh, cooperation within the Lublin Triangle, which I think one of the uh, key uh, uh, initiatives that was happening during the last time uh, in Eastern Europe, uh, which would include uh, uh, Poland and Lithuania. I think that uh, they are very much knowledgeable about everything that's going on in, the, in Ukraine and Belarus and have vital interests which are uh, related to this. And the more we cooperate between each other, uh, the faster our countries would be uh, members of one European Union and the democracy and freedom would flourish. Thank you, Elia. Yes, I share your opinion. We, we, have, to, we have to do this uh, cooperation between Eastern Europe, uh, work together uh, at the level of civil society and also of um, some uh, thinkers and, uh, and uh, politicians. And uh, that's, that's also my, my target. Uh, Pavlo, your reactions. Uh, look, uh, I very much like uh, the sense of uh, active, sympathy with, uh, with the Belarusian people. It's, it's not just saying, okay, it's great. It's a, it's, it's a real motion behind it. And I, 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 I really like it. What, uh, what actually struck me, it's a, it's a sort of uh, agreement uh, among all of us that uh, answers uh, for all three are quite different and should be quite different. But at the end of the day, it's important to get Belarus in a, in a different reality, into the European reality. As you know, Belarusians are quite, quite close to Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. We understand each other without interpretation. Belarusian is actually the closest language to Ukrainian. We have uh, historical roots. We have uh, overlaps, I mean, uh, not the same, but overlaps in mentality and basically a lot, uh, a lot together. And I believe Ukraine uh, should play uh, far more. And I'm, uh, I'm a bit diplomatic here or probably too diplomatic here, far more proactive role in, uh, in simply getting the, uh, the, uh, the Belarusians and Belarus on the right track. And uh, it was a good discussion uh, around, but uh, my, my take out of it is that with, with very different people, with very different projections, with very different experience, we actually have been getting closer to, uh, to one uh, simple point is, uh, and this, uh, you know, uh, this simple point is the status quo is, uh, is not the way forward. It's not sustainable in a different way for uh, for all three of us, but uh, but simply not sustainable. And we have different tests, we have different uh, you know take uh, around our realities, but we simply have to get better. We simply have to help each other. Simply good people like Ilya has just said, and and go forward. It's uh, it's about us and nobody whether from the US or from the European Union, will help us without uh, ourselves not being able uh, to help ourselves. It's as simple as that. And thanks a lot for a good discussion. Merci, Pavlo. I promise you, uh, from Belarus, Ukraine, uh, Russia, and Poland, and Lithuania, all the Eastern part of Europe, I promise we will organize other conferences like that. I think it's very important, as you said, Ilya, it's very important. And I know, Pavlo, you will support us also, but I think it's very important to speak between us, between civil society, because we have, we have our destiny in our hand. And I think it's very important. We have to wait for nothing. We have to do everything um, ourselves. Uh, now, I want to give the floor to our superwoman, from Belarus, Olga and Ekaterina.
Then I will start with Olga uh, in Minsk. Um, <laughs> Superwoman, we would really need one <laughs> here to solve the problems. Uh, or Catwoman, I don't know. <laughs> well, um, uh, really, uh, after today was a very difficult day regarding the news in the country, but after today's discussion, uh, I feel uh, better uh, physically and mentally because I feel uh, support from people. And uh, what, all, what I understood or, or what I started to understand it was when uh, Mr. or Dr. Wolfgang was um, uh, saying about Armenia and uh, um, that uh, we have to be united and speak up. I mean, we in uh, in Europe in general, because uh, uh, we think that Europe is united, but probably it's not as united as, uh, as it can be. And we have to contribute and we have to speak up about different problems, not only about Belarus, but about different problems uh, in, uh, in Europe and around Europe. It's not only Russia or US, who can speak up and this is what um, uh, I maybe I understand why all this uh, new European dot net uh, exists that we have a platform uh, to feel solidarity to feel support and to speak up um, I I would really like to continue and I really feel that uh, this is helping and uh, this is also educating, and uh, I feel like this is an interesting field. And uh, I understand that politics is not only a dirty game that some people are playing, but this is something that should be done by ordinary people in uh, normal countries. And I really, I would really like uh, Belarus to be there one day. So this is what is my um, taking from the, today's, um, and thank you once again for the award um, from all the Russian people, uh, women, uh, if I may speak from yeah. their behalf. Thank you, Olga. Uh, you know, uh, from Ukraine, I think, uh, Alexandra, Pavlo, uh, even Ilya from Russia, we feel, can say, very sensitive uh, when, 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 when you spoke uh, a few minutes ago. Because we, we were in this case in, in Kiev during Euromaidan and in Russia, and uh, Ilya know <laughs> very well that uh, we have some friends who are in jail and we had some friends who were killed. Then uh, that your speech was very strong for me, very strong. Uh, Ekaterina, Italy. <laughs> <laughs> well, physically, I'm in Italy, but for four months, my, my mind is in Belarus. And Olga said that we need to speak up. I would add that in this very moment, the Belarusians need that we speak up about what's going on in Belarus. We... Uh, we have people who get killed by the police. Uh, we, we have people who are completely defenseless and helpless in front of the authorities, which can do whatever they want, but really whatever they want to a citizen who dared to express his or her disagreement with the dictatorship. So, um, please continue to speak up about what's going on in Belarus. It is important because the Belarusian authorities um, must not have the possibility to, um, to perform their crimes in the darkness. Their crimes should be brought up to light and uh, you can help us to do so, so please do help us. Thank you so much for your attention and for all the words of solidarity and support that I have heard 
so far this evening. Thank you so much. And thank you so much again for the award to the Belarusian women. It's um, a very um, uh, important uh, gesture from your part. And uh, we are really honored to receive it, Olga and I, uh, from the New Europeans for all Belarusian women. And I think Olga, who said in the very beginning of our conference today, she said, I'm an ordinary Belarusian woman, so I do not know if I can take this prize for on the behalf of, of all. I would say, yes, you can, because it's you who, who fights in the streets. It's not someone who represents the Belarusians uh, at conferences or official meetings. It's people who fight in the streets who are the real heroes of the moment. Merci. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. We, we will continue to speak about uh, Belarus. We continue to support you. I know, uh, I know because I, I, I was on Euromaidan and I know that's, that's, that you will have, you will have big trauma to, to manage. And uh, to, to help you to manage this trauma and this post-trauma, we, we must speak a lot and we must share a lot because the trauma will be there and is, is there. And uh, I remember with all, all, all the Euromaidaners, we spoke a lot after Euromaidan because we had to share a lot. And that's very important. And uh, we will do that to help you because uh, the trauma is there and uh, you need to speak. You need to speak and we, and we will speak. I want to give some minutes to Maria Laura because Maria Laura, you are the beginning of the, of the support for Belarus. Maria Laura? After we will that's give... It. Yeah. yeah, that's it. I'm sorry. Um, a few, I just... Maria Laura, a few minutes, because after we will give the floor to the ambassador, former ambassador uh, of US to Ukraine, uh, yes. Mr. Herbst. Just very, very few words. And I just want to make sure that uh, our uh, Belarusian uh, ladies who are attending this and everybody, have to make uh, to, to know that we will not abandon them. In spite of whatever we have said about Europe not supporting and uh, all, all this, uh, Europeans are with you and there is quite a lot of interest. And the fact that you have addressed the press, uh, it's very important. I mean, I say to Katerina who um, got in, in contact with me and I reacted positively and this was very important. We started um, uh, dialogue together and this this uh, this is what we have to continue continue to keep the subject um, hot in our uh, media papers facebook every everywhere so this is uh, we will not uh, we will not abandon you merci merci maria loa thank you very much because you you are the key of this story with belarus between europe and belarus now I want to give the floor to former ambassador to Ukraine, the ambassador John Epst from, from the Atlantic Council. Please welcome from Washington. Thank you. I apologize for, for tuning in right now. And I'm a little bit concerned that if I speak at the moment, I may repeat things that have already been said, but- uh, Please, please go, go. <laughs> okay. okay, all right, all right. Uh, the, view, the view from Washington and uh, now I'm giving you what I think the U.S. government is doing, is uh, obviously there's, there's a sympathy with the people of Belarus. There's a recognition that the demonstrations are absolutely extraordinary, right? We're now going on, what, uh, five, three, three plus months of demonstrations, despite some severe repression. There was an effort, uh, I think a successful effort to establish contact with Ms. Tsihanouskaya uh, when Pompeo went to the region and also to get a feel for what Moscow might do. Uh, but while there's sympathy and a measure of support, there's also a reluctance to offer more support than we're willing to actually provide if the Kremlin were to crack down. There's also a sense that Moscow desperately does not want to crack down, although it's clear uh, Moscow wants to make sure that they have their man in charge in Minsk. 
At the moment, that's Lukashenko, but they've also clearly hinted publicly um, of a willingness to remove him after a quote unquote decent interval. And th that is roughly the view from here. Um, my understanding, this is not public, but there's a good chance that we will see a visit by Ms. Tsihanouskaya to Washington before the end of the year. And I would just add in the wake of our presidential elections, um, I think that Biden's policy on Belarus will be very similar to Trump's. Maybe there'll be a, a bit more enthusiasm for the demonstrators, but a recognition of the limits of our power, um, given the fact that Moscow ultimately may play military, play a military card. Oh, and one, one more thing. I believe one thing we may see more of, uh, perhaps especially if there is a Biden administration, or additional sanctions on uh, key members of the Belarus regime. Uh, I am now not hearing you. We are hearing you. Uh, now I hear you. Yeah, it's okay. What is your opinion about the, the, the yes, we speak about Belarus, but what is your opinion about Ukraine, uh, Ukraine and, and with Ukraine with new new administration, with Biden administration, and also Russia with the Biden administration? Uh, I would say that the Biden policy towards Russia and Ukraine, similar to the Belarus policy, will um, be 85% of what it was under Trump. But there are two very important nuances. First, uh, Trump's attitude towards both NATO and the EU was um, iconoclastic. Uh, he challenged the, the uh, importance of NATO for the United States. And he regularly showed disrespect for the organization in his public remarks, including in, at least partly, in his performances at NATO summits. And of course, he expressed real uh, doubts about the EU as a, an unfair trade competitor with the United States. There will be none of that with Biden. Biden will reaffirm the importance of American leadership in NATO and the traditional, not, not, not just the traditional NATO role in Europe, but uh, a stronger NATO policy outside of Europe. And Biden will also be favorably disposed towards the European Union. And of course, I'm, I'm, I'm mentioning this in connection with Russia and Ukraine because strength of the Western allies is important for a more effective policy on Russia and Ukraine. The second, the second distinction <coughs> between Biden and Trump is rhetorical. Um, I, I think that the Trump's policies were on balance good vis-a-vis -vis Russia and Ukraine with the exception of that nasty effort to pull Zelensky into our American politics. But that nasty effort only lasted a few weeks because publicly it could not be defended. And once it became public, Trump had to backtrack. But while, that's, while Trump's policies, with that exception, were pretty good or have been pretty good, his rhetoric has not been. Um, he has regularly expressed disgust for Ukraine behind closed doors, which had a way of becoming public. And publicly, he always took a very soft stance with the Kremlin and with Putin. And that was not consistent with his policies. With Biden, there will be no discrepancy between his statements and his overall policy. So on balance, I think the policies will be better. And just to repeat, the policies are one of pushing back against Kremlin revisionism in Europe, uh, Kremlin belief that it can dictate the foreign policies and national security policies of its neighbors, and support for the countries in the Soviet, excuse me, the Russian near abroad to choose their own political systems, economic systems, and international orientation. Uh, so that, that's how I see this, this will play out. Thank you. Thank you very much for your, for your presentation. Uh, now is the end of our conference. We, we have to finish. Then I, I want to conclude. I think uh, I am I am very optimistic uh, between the uh, relation between the EU and US. We have to reinforce our Atlantic relationship very strongly. We have to be together uh, because we have no choice. 
then uh, we have to be very strong together, EU and US, um, because the world need that. And uh, our friend in Belarus, in Ukraine, need uh, our help. Uh, I think I want also to add a few points. Uh, we will continue to do conference like that. You, you spoke about that, Ilya. I think it's a great uh, idea to continue to speak between a uh, person from the Eastern Europe about our problems, uh, to improve our democracy, our election process. It's very, I think it's very important to discuss between us. And I think we have to do other conference like that. And I want to conclude that we will not stop to to uh, to support uh, Belarus and to support Ukraine, but to support Belarus first because they are now protests in Belarus. And uh, be sure that we are with you. And uh, this award is only a beginning of our relationship. Um, then thank you very much for all all of you. And uh, and again, I, I want to say congratulations uh, for this award. And I am very happy that today we have a lot of European, European countries, but also a representative of US. And that's, that's make me very optimistic. Thank you very much and see you for a next conference. Apologize again for being late. Very late. Bye-bye. No <laughs>